The warthog. Not Timon and Pumba warthog. The Fairchild Republic, A-10, Lightning Bolt, or simply the Hog, is one of the most iconic planes in the US Air That looks sick. A plane developed in the middle of the Cold War with a specific type of warfare in mind. If the Cold War turned hot, one area was destined to become a battleground. A 50 km corridor of lowland valleys called the Fulda Gap, where any invading troops would be channeled on their march from East Germany to West Germany. Hmm. It was the shortest route to France, Frankfurt, and the strategically important Rhine River. If war broke out, this corridor would be a vital region to secure, and each side of the Fulda Gap was defended by armoured divisions. To cope with this threat environment, the US developed an operational doctrine called Airland Battle and the A-10 was developed as a vital component of this strategy. That's quite mad. So they made this plane in the middle of the Cold War, which is like basically saying, we know this scenario is likely, we need to build something to avoid it. So let's, they've literally made this fighter jet. It's good though, because they're prepared. Yeah, they're tailoring their need yeah. to stop and to obviously to give them the upper hand in the war. And I, I bet the, you know, others, the opponents probably done something similar, but it's mad because they're still using this uh, fighter jet now to, to this, this day. day. Yeah. Isn't it? A low flying tank killer, which would work tank closely killer. with the troops on the ground to break up enemy formations at the front, while high flying bombers harassed the supply lines at the rear. Mm. The A-10 was a plane designed specifically for the role of close air support. Close air support is exactly that, close. Close to friendly forces and close to unfriendly forces. It requires a plane to be capable of absorbing a great deal of damage as they come under fire and to be incredibly accurate with its weapons to avoid friendly fire. A plane with this role needs some unique qualities. I bet one of the qualities is going to be mobility. Because if you're kind of like there, you need to be mobile, they need to be in and out doing mad movement within that firing range because obviously they're not far up they're kind of within range of the foot soldiers so they, it needs to be mobile so it's not easily taken out by like rocket launchers of the enemy and mm. stuff like that it needs to be lightweight as Light, well Light, mobile, to be accurate. able to move quick as well yeah. because bear in mind it is flying closer to ground so it'll be an easy target exactly and that's why it needs to be moving yeah but at the same time, it needs. I'm guessing it needs some sort of body to be able to handle a bullet. But then it's like tanks. If if a bomb can destroy a tank, what material are you using on a plane? Because tanks are meant to be really strong, yeah, heavy yeah, duty, I'm aren't sure, they? I'm sure a tank is more heavy duty than... Am I right to say, you guys comment below, is a tank more heavy duty in terms of taking damage then the I warthog. Think it is. I would assume it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, it needs to be light, but it needs to be able to, mm. you know, it needs to be a Handle certain material. The yeah. yeah, material. It needs to be available at a moment's notice. In an ever evolving battlefield, troops could need support without warning. And because of this, the plane needs to be nearby and ready to go. This means working from forward bases that may not necessarily have all the infrastructure and equipment that other planes need to operate. Its survivability needs to be best in class. There we go. Flying this close to the ground is going to result in every man with a weapon mm -hmm. taking pot shots at the plane. Yeah. As a result, the plane needs to be capable of dealing with small arms, machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and even missiles. A-10s frequently limp back to their base with damage so severe that they would have downed another plane. Damn. With parts of their wings ripped off with an engine taken out and hydraulics unoperational. And coming with this, the plane needs to be simple and cheap to manufacture. The Air Force made it clear from the beginning, in a battle of cost versus performance, cost would be prioritized. That's so much requirements though, because it needs to be all of that and be cheap to produce so you could produce them quick and easy. But how do you do that with but the cheap thing production? Is, with a cheap production, you can't invest into good quality material. This is why I'm thinking, how the hell did they make it so damage absorbing? Because they're saying it takes so much damage that other planes would have uh, 
been taken out once you know with the same damage that that warthog takes once it comes to base so how did they do that they we'll mastered find out, honey pie. they mastered keeping the price low but let's uh, find out durability high yeah in an all-out war with the soviets quantity and ease of manufacturing was going to be a huge factor that's mad like the sherman and the t-34 tanks which were so influential in world war ii a future war between the Soviets and the US was expected to be won by whoever could outmanufacture and maintain their equipment. This plane was intended to be a cheap and rugged workhorse. It needed to be made with readily available off-the-shelf parts. I like so it's got a face. Could easily interchange parts to repair damage quickly and at a low cost. Contractors bidding for the manufacturing contract needed to consider all of these factors and design the entire plane around the primary armament which was chosen before the design process started. The General Electric GAU-8A, a gun whose sound is so recognizable it has become a meme. The gun takes up a significant portion of the plane's internal volume at nearly six meters long, wow. fitting snugly below the pilot. The largest part of the gun is the ammo drum, which typically holds 1,150 30 millimeter rounds. Over a thousand know. bullets in that drum. So how much is the weight of that as well? A thousand bullets and bullets aren't light no. and they're going to be like armor be penetrated. Big bullets as yeah. well. Wow. The rounds are delivered to the seven rotating barrels along a linkless shoot system, which also pulls the shell casings back into the ammo drum after firing to prevent the expended shells from damaging the plane. The belt system and the rotating cam firing system of the barrels are both driven by a hydraulic motor, which is powered by two independent hydraulic systems on board. There are two separate hydraulic systems to ensure redundancy in operation, and both run the gun. The left and right hydraulic systems are pressurized by two identical engine-driven pumps on the left and right engine. If an engine is lost or one of the hydraulic lines is broken, then the controls powered by those hydraulics cease to work. Mm. However, the plane has been designed to allow it to continue flying on only one hydraulic system as both elevators, both ailerons and one rudder have hydraulic power after loss of either hydraulic lines, ensuring powered control of pitch, roll and yaw even after the loss of a single hydraulic system. If both are lost, the plane can switch to a manual reversion flight control system where the controls can be operated without power assist, which is difficult to say the least, but that's so mad these planes like the fact that they can still move and still fly even with like damaged systems because they've got backup systems and then backup systems to those backup systems and it's like crazy to think that engineering to be able to make that a thing you know because like look at a car if something fails in a car that car's that's stopping it, yeah. gone you gotta take it guy the thing is you're not taking a car to war. Yeah, exactly. You're taking this to war. You're going to make sure this is top notch. Mm. So you're going to make sure your system has a backup and that backup has a backup. And there's lives that in play as well. Of like course. You've got to protect Because if that pilot. fails, your pilot's dying. Yeah. And a pilot, I'm sure, is very uh, valuable to the they're military. They're all valuable. Yeah. Each member of staff is valuable. For them, yeah. Because they're fighting for the country. It's dependent on them. On <sighs> they the need outcome. all the right tools and all the right yeah. things in place for it to work. It's mad. It can allow the pilot to land the plane safely or, at the very least, allow them to get into safe airspace. <laughs> I like that. Parachute, man. This kind of redundancy can be found in every component of the A-10 to increase survivability. The landing gear is retracted by the left system only, but it can be extended by both, and in the event neither system is available, the wing-mounted landing gear doesn't actually retract all the way into the fairings, which allows the plane to land with landing gear retracted with only moderate damage to the plane. Protecting the control mechanisms through redundancy is just one component of increasing survivability. The fuel tanks are self-sealing on the lower portions and are filled with foam to prevent explosions. That's clever. The A-10, like all planes, can fly with significant armor covering every portion of the plane. So they just protect the most vital component on the plane, the stick operator, otherwise known as the pilot, <laughs> who sits inside a titanium tub which is reported to be capable of absorbing direct hits from armor piercing rounds up to 23 millimeters. Wow. One thing I know about titanium, I've got the latest iPhone and they advertise that the 
back is titanium and that's like a selling point. But the reason why mm -hmm. is because it's meant to be a very strong metal, but that's very light. So you're getting super durability, but without the clunkiness and the weight of what you'd think and it should be. And like uh, the commentator just mentioned, it absorbs yeah, a lot of shock very as strong. Well. Without taking as much damage, physical damage. It's a strong metal, titanium. I'm gonna test that. Your new for your new phone it. coming is the titanium back as well. Yeah, it is. The canopy is also made from ballistic glass, capable of taking hits from small arms. But this isn't the type of plane to be flying upside down over the battlefield. This is more for shrapnel from anti-aircraft fire and missiles. The A-10 also carries more chaff and flares than any US Air Force legacy fighter. Chaff is radar reflective material which confuses radar controlled missiles, mm. while flares confuse heat seeking missiles. That's With clever. Four dispensers located in the landing gear pods and another four on the outer wingtips for a total of 16 across both wings, which can be triggered automatically by radar and laser detection systems on the nose and wingtips of the plane or simply fired manually by the pilot. One of the most striking features of the A-10 is its strange engine placement and tail configuration. And this too was a design feature to thwart enemies with heat seeking missiles. The engines and tail were arranged like this to mask the infrared signature of the hot exhaust of the plane, which could be used to lock onto the plane by IR missiles on the ground. The tail mm. would look more at home on a World War II bomber, which were designed to be stable. Stability was an important part of the A-10's design. The large vertical stabilizers help keep the plane on target as it fires its insanely powerful gun. The gun is mounted directly on the center line of the plane to minimize the effect of the recoil, pushing the plane off target. The recoil force at 44.5 kilonewtons is so powerful that it effectively halves the plane's forward thrust as each of the A-10's General Electric T-34 engines wow. produces just 41 kilonewtons of thrust. But the plane fires in such short bursts, typically one to two seconds, that the pilot doesn't need to worry about stalling. The high engines. So if that, if the power of the gun was doubled and it was shooting, does that mean the plane will like literally shift, back. shift backwards? Because it's, imagine that it's so powerful. The, is shifting your plane back <laughs> while you're fly mid flying forward. Mm -hmm. That's so crazy. But this is why they need to balance everything out. It's all. I'm sure they do all the statistics yeah. before deciding. The testing. Yeah, it's all. It's not. It's not just done and hoping for the best. They st mathematically, statistically, make sure things. They are, must I don't test know. it as well. Yeah, I'm sure they just. But yeah, of course they'll test it. But I'm saying before they even do it. Yeah. The numbers need to be right. The physics. The physics and yeah. the maths. And then they'll do it and test it. And yeah, all right, we were right. Cool, we're yeah. good to go. Let's, let's start producing it like this. Mounted behind the wings also reduced the amount of dirt and dust that can enter the engines from forward operating base runways, which can be just dirt runways. A lot of design choices were made to allow the plane to operate from remote airfields like this. Smaller military planes like this don't typically have auxiliary power units, which are small secondary engines that large planes like airliners have. You can see the exhaust of these little hidden engines in the tails of airliners. These engines allow the plane to start its main engines without external help and help run functions like electricity generation and hydraulic fluid pumps. But it's unnecessary weight for most small aircraft and they usually use some other way to get the engine spinning Sometimes this results in the plane relying on ground equipment, which the A-10 cannot depend on. And so an APU was installed between the two potted engines. You can see the exhaust of the APU just underneath the nacelles here. Some of the most interesting design challenges arose from the sheer power of the aircraft's gun. The gun spits out go. so much burnt and unburnt propellant that they actually lost an early model in 1978 after exhaust gas from the gun ignited and starved the engines of oxygen. Oh. To deal with this, some design changes were made. First, a small gas scoop was placed underneath the barrels to suck in some of that exhaust. The chemical mixture of the round propellant was changed to increase the flash suppressant levels. This in turn caused secondary problems as the new chemical mixture caused residue to build up on the cockpit windows and a canopy washer was needed. 
This is why engineers get paid so much because they're like, all right, this is an issue. We need to figure out what's the most effective way of dealing with this issue. All right, we fixed it. But now that issue has caused this Creating issue. Creating a new issue. Shit. Let's do, oh, do you know what I mean? Like engineers, yeah. like they're such a big part, I can imagine, in the like development of the military. So they must get paid so well. Which simply sprayed the washing fluid onto the canopy and the slipstream did the rest of the work. Circuitry was also added to force the engine ignition system to continually fire while the gun trigger was being pulled so that in the event a flame out occurred, the engine could rekindle its flame immediately. The GAU-8 Avenger is a monstrous machine designed to wreak havoc on those Soviet tanks attempting to push through Allied lines. To do this, they need heavy armor-piercing rounds. Yeah, the rounds are truly about massive that. at 30 millimeters, and sprinkled throughout these rounds are rounds made of aluminium with a depleted uranium core. Uranium is insanely dense at 19.1 grams per centimeter cubed. Lead, in comparison, is 11.3 grams per centimeter cubed, and iron is 7.9. Wow. This density gives the round more kinetic energy for armor-piercing. The depleted uranium also ablates material in a way that self-sharpens the projectile, while tungsten, which is slightly denser than uranium, tends to mushroom out and dulls itself upon impact. That's crazy. So even though tungsten is more uh, dense, it doesn't cut through like that. So this material, this I is think it's because of the shape as well, though. Was it different shape though? Yeah. Look at the uranium. It's pointed, no. No, but it became like this once it hit. Oh. So it, it even though it's more dense, when it hit, it became like that because it wasn't, it's not as whatever this uranium has. Even though it's denser, in theory, you'll think, oh, something dense is more, you know, able to uh, survive, but it's actually bent it. Mm. So they, they said uranium, even though it's less dense, is better for Cuts through better. armor penetration. Yeah. It's mad for tanks specifically. There is currently 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium stored as uranium hexafluoride in huge storage cylinders across Africa, costing uranium enrichment facilities a great amount in maintenance. They are simply delighted when someone gets it off their hands and fires it at high speed into a country thousands of miles away. It's a cheap and freely available resource and has the perfect material properties for armor piercing. But the efficacy of using depleted uranium is obviously not good. Many war-torn regions have blamed its use for elevated cases of cancer. Oh, the A-10 has been under constant threat of retirement. Detractors have pushed from the very start that the plane is not needed. First, it was the F-16 which should take over its job, and now it's the F-35. And both sides of the argument have valid points. The F-16 and A-10 can carry similar amounts of ordnance into the battlefield if needed. Both have 11 hardpoints with a carrying capacity over 7.2 tons, but attaching heavy equipment to its wings negates the biggest advantage of the F-16, its maneuverability and ability to conserve mm. kinetic energy in dogfights. The F-16 was designed to be a multi-role fighter, while the A-10 was designed for one job and one job only getting down and dirty and taking some punches like Rocky. What? I they need to keep Rocky that, Balboa. They need to keep the A10. Adrian! <laughs> Adrian! They need to keep that shit. Don't get rid of that. That that A10's there to get dirty. Hmm. We that's what you you need that kind of machinery or that you know that person that just doesn't give a shit in a fight and just, you know, is ready to risk it all. But that's they the A10. Mentioned that it does cause cancer. Yeah, that people argue there's no, I don't know if it's, I doubt it's been proven, but that people are saying this, it could be the reason. Mm. But at A10 though, you ain't getting rid of the Warthog. Nothing no. can replace that. No. While modern planes like the F-35 were designed to be more like Muhammad Ali. Moving, <laughs> elusive, striking and moving out of the enemy's range before they can react. The two planes were designed in completely different eras with completely mm. different military doctrine in mind and trying to compare the two without acknowledging that is silly. Look how different they look like from times like modern to modern uh, engineering to old school engineering. They look yeah, so it's that class. It develops, isn't yeah. it? Like technology is evolving. Just you know, the mindsets evolving, new what ideas works, coming into work. yeah, and then you can compare like the old 
structure to the new structure, the advantages, the disadvantages of the old structure. So considering they're quite similar, they look so different. Yeah. The F-35 is designed to carry a small payload of weapons in its internal weapons bay, while stealth is a high priority. Stealth, but it can carry that. just as much as the F-16 when air superiority is established. It's a multi-role fighter designed for the modern battlefield. Ultimately, the A-10 found a role in wars like Iraq and Afghanistan where the threat level and sophistication of enemy weaponry was relatively low, like the battles expected in the Fulda Gap in the 1980s. The A-10 persists today because it excels in its role as a close air support vehicle hmm. and its low cost of running compared to other military planes wow. has kept it competitive, allowing it to be in the vanguard for military operations today. A plane the infantry can see coming over the horizon, like Gandalf arriving into Helm's Deep to lift the siege. <laughs> they can't save in the day again, baby. Hey, turn, baby. Imagine being in the military like that and you're like, oh, we got that. Like, Oh, we got uh, air support. Oh, look, it's the A-10. The Warthog was on its way. You so know, that's Warthog. How it is. That's how it is. It's that's Pumba. How, that's how, yeah, well, the Raptors here. Yeah. That's how they are. You know, it's mad, but it's, it's a different world. <laughs> it's become an iconic aircraft among the soldiers on the ground. That's jokes. The bond has formed between it and the infantry it protects. But just as the A-10 was created in preparation for an anticipated next generation war, the F-35 was created with future wars in mind, mm. where the threat environment would be so dense that simply being able to take a punch won't save it. Mm. The nature of close air support has continually evolved over the past century. In World War II, tactical air forces were created specifically for providing close air support to the troops landing in Normandy on D-Day. Range for these fighters was a major tactical issue and within 24 hours of the first men landing in Normandy, three new emergency landing strips had been created off the beaches, which would allow the Allies to extend their fighter-bomber range and prevent a fierce counter-attack by the Germans from overwhelming the small toehold the Allies managed to carve out in Normandy. I explore these vital logistical challenges in a future episode of the Logistics of D-Day that will be out next month. These airfields were primarily built to extend the reach of Allied aerial support as ground troops push forward. However, as the front line progressed, many were converted to supply depots, emergency evacuation posts and heavy bomber airfields. Others were simply abandoned and allowed to return to farmland over time. There are hidden traces of these remains littered all over Normandy.